At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. Well, hello, I'm David Nutt and welcome to this rather special podcast from the uh, Drug Science series. Because today, uh, I'm not the person asking the questions, I'm the person being interrogated. And I'm delighted <laughs> to welcome on the show with me, Joss Stone, who's going to ask me all those questions that she and hopefully most of you wanted to know the answers to. I cannot wait. I'm so excited to ask you all these questions. I'm one of the lucky ones. I get to ask you in person. How lucky am I? Well, I'm That's looking brilliant. forward to it, Joss. And uh, I gather you're starting your own podcast series to compete with me. Is that right? I, yes, I am. And um, it's all about happiness. It's called Cup of Happy, actually. Cup of Happy. Because who right. doesn't like a nice cup of tea? It's, you know, comforting. It certainly is. And do you want to know why that is, by the way? Why? I've Tell written me. a paper on that. Have you? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> okay. Because warmth stimulates the nerves which release serotonin in the happiness centre. Oh, my goodness. So it's actually scientifically true. A cup of anything warm makes you happy. Yeah. I wrote a paper called That Warm Fuzzy Feeling. And also the same about going into saunas. Uh, so ah. heat releases serotonin, particularly in the parts of the brain where serotonin regulates mood. Really? Do you know what? That's why I get so upset when I get cold. Yeah, probably. Absolutely. I hate being cold. Oh, it totally pisses me off. I'm not a fan. <laughs> I won't go in the water when I go to the beach. I'm one of those. It's, it's terrible. It just like, oh, it makes me upset. So, wow, that's why. Okay, so I really need to ask you a million questions about cannabis. Oh, okay. The reason why I'm so interested in cannabis, and there's lots of drugs I know that you know a lot about, Obviously, it's part of the musical culture, but mm -hmm. that's not why mm -hmm. I'm interested in it, contrary to popular belief. It's because I've read so much about how cannabis helps people with cancer. And I know it helps, yeah. you know, different tumours differently. Yeah. But yeah. I had an experience with my dog, which I mentioned briefly to you last time. Mm -hmm. She had a mass in her bladder. She's tiny. She was literally five pounds, this dog. And she had this mass and she was 13 and they said to me, so sorry, Joss, but we've got to, we can't operate, she's too small, can't do any of that. Uh, we're going to do the chemo and the, and the radiotherapy. And I'd been looking it up. Previously, I'd been looking up how cannabis affects tumours. Yeah. So I said to the lady in the vets, I was like, well, have you heard about that? And she said, well, I really can't discuss that with you, you know, because it's not part of, yeah. <laughs> they're not allowed. It's not part of the list of things they're allowed mm. to talk about with you. Um, and I said, well, she's going to have a horrible last year if I do the chemo. Mm -hmm. And if I do the cannabis, I mean, at least she'll be sleeping and feeling okay. So I just, I did it for two months. She was very stoned. Anyway, I took her to the vet's a different vet this mm -hmm, time, mm -hmm. and I asked them to scan it to see yep. if the mass was still there, and it was gone, completely, completely disappeared. Remarkable. Now, yeah. do you think that, that, that cannabis had part of that, or do you think maybe I just got lucky? Well, the dog got lucky, yeah. Uh, well, no, uh, one of the reasons I became interested in the potential of medical cannabis was that uh, talking to a, uh, one of the United Patients Alliance uh, starters, really, uh -huh. a man with stomach cancer who'd been told to go and die. Right. And he was treating himself with um, basically cannabis oil. Mm -hmm. And he started, it was a really vivid description. He said he's, after a few days he started to vomit sort of stuff a little bit like coffee. Oh, wow. And um, 
he worked out that actually it was, the cancer was sort of dying and he, he was, you know, it was a stomach cancer and he, he was vomiting it out. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, you know, he's live many years afterwards. So I thought, that's wow, quite remarkable. Yeah. You know, that's um, very unusual for stomach cancer to suddenly kill Just itself. Just die. Yeah, that's right. So I thought, well, maybe there's something in this. And who are we to know? You know, I mean, unless we talk to patients, unless we get experience, unless we do studies on people we won't know and uh, so that's why I've become I'm very very interested in getting cannabis much more widely Mm. into medicine. I hear and most of my information is from just googling. Most people's is these days. (laughs) Yeah but I'm just googling and um, I hear things like well you can't overdose on it because we have endocannabinoids and if if it's in our bloodstream already then you can't then it's non-toxic can you explain a little bit about what that even means? Because when I first heard endocannabinoid, I didn't even know what it meant. So endo means inside you. Right. And it's already there, like naturally, right? Yes. It's not exactly the same chemical as THC or cannabidiol, but it works on the same receptor. And that's one of the great discoveries in science in the last 50 years is the fact that the body makes these endocannabinoids. Um, you're like one, one of them is called a nandamide which is the Sanskrit for bliss. Oh. Uh, and another one has got a much more mundane, prosaic name called 2-AG, 2-Acylglycerol. Are these and, the receptors? Um, no, these are the substances. Oh, the receptors are just called cannabis receptor 1 and cannabis receptor 2. Right. Cannabis receptor 1 is in the brain and cannabis receptor 2 is on the immune system. And it's quite likely that the effects on your dog were through the cannabis receptor 2, ah. altering immune function. To Basically, your immune system's... A lot of what it does is wipe out early cancers. And, uh, and, oh, and it's really? one of the things, if, if you're immunosuppressed, for instance, you know, if you're having a marrow transplant, then immunosuppression puts you at a risk of more cancers because your immune system isn't scavenging them up all the time. Of but, course. Uh, but that's a kind of another story. So your body makes these endocannabinoids, the natural substances that are made and have been around for almost the whole of of life, not just human life. Mm. And, and we didn't really know what they did until... Well, we still don't really know what they do, but they seem to balance out. We call them adaptogens. They seem to stabilise functions in cells. So if you've got too much of something, they calm it down. If you've got too little of something, they enhance it. Right. Uh, and, and so they kind of bring everything back to the normal, to the central position, which is, which is why cannabis can be so effective in so many different disorders, because in every disorder, something's a bit awry. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be... Very specific. It seems to be very wide-reaching. All the things yes. I hear, it, it can help. That's it's right. like it's just a blanket, isn't it? And that was why you know people were doctors are suspicious. But in reality, it's um, it's because you're stabilising normal function. And you know, mm. and it's it's not it's not the first time we discovered things. I mean, hormones do the same thing. You know, I mean, if you if you have yeah. too much thyroid or too little thyroid, things go awry. But you need the right amount of thyroid. You need the right amount of endocannabinoid. The real challenge at present is proving that there's a deficiency in people who benefit from cannabis. We haven't got the tools to measure this, these endocannabinoids in humans in the places we need to measure them, like the brain, oh. to show if they're deficient. So, for, I mean, one presumes they are deficient in people with epilepsy, and then you take cannabis oil and then you, you restore the natural balance and you stop having fits. But right. we can't prove that. We can measure other things in the body, though. We can measure if you're deficient in iron, but we can't do... Yeah. That with cannabinoids. Yes, um, and there are some technical reasons for that. It's partly the fact that these are relatively recently discovered. It's partly that they are very fragile. If you take blood, you know, they, they get, tend to get destroyed. But people are trying. And, um, they so, will, you know, you they'll You can succeed. measure them in blood. We will, no, I, indeed, we will. And I think the more cannabis becomes a medicine, the more impetus there will be for people to get the tools sorted out so we can measure them. I suppose like any medicine, some people don't do well with it. Do you think those people are the ones that have enough cannabinoids, probably maybe more than enough and don't need any more? You know how people get psychosis and, and you know, bad effects from cannabis. Um, why yes, why yes. did some get that and why did some not? Well, that's a question we, to which we don't have the answer at present. But it, mm. the predisposition to psychosis seems to be genetic. Oh, really? Seems to run in families. And uh, there is an enzyme mm-hmm. called COMPT. There's a little bit of evidence. It says if if you've got a variant of that enzyme, you may be more vulnerable to cannabis-induced psychosis oh. through through the release of a transmitter called dopamine. 
Oh, that's the happy one. Uh, well, it's the happy one, but it's also, if you have too much of it, it's also the make you paranoid one, yes. Mm. Oh, really? Yes. So that's why you might just get the giggles and then feel really terrified. Yes, that's right. As you start to... Re- Dopamine's just going mad. The giggles isn't all about dopamine, by the way. Oh, pray tell. Ah, well, so <laughs> the reason cannabis gives people the giggles, makes them relax and happy, is it's more complex than just dopamine. Because dopamine gives you the sort of drive to have fun and, and, and mm-hmm. the motivation to, to engage and chat to people, for instance, if you're having fun. But many drugs, and not just cannabis, but also psychedelics, MDMA, one of the first things they do, and alcohol too, is they, mm-hmm. they dampen down the frontal part of the brain. And that's where most of us hold our stress and our tension. Mm. And so people get the giggles with various drugs because that part of the brain, which is normally monitoring what we do and making sure we do things right and looking around and making sure we're not making... <laughs> that gets switched off. Being careful. And then you just relax. Yeah, yeah. and then you become happy and cheerful. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. With the happiness part of life, you are healthier immediately. That's my opinion. Because when people are stressed and sad, I notice that they get poorly. They get sick. Yes, absolutely. When someone's laughing and, I don't know, they just seem, they literally seem healthier in the, in the second they start to laugh. I wonder yeah. if that's even real. I think, it's, no, it's absolutely real. I think, mm. uh, and I think optimists, well, it's been shown, optimists live longer than pessimists. <gasps> Has that been proven? Really? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. good news for me. <laughs> But it's more than that. I mean, we, we actually, it's very interesting you mention this. There's almost no research on the benefits of happiness, partly because it's actually quite difficult to induce in people, you know, in a laboratory. How do you make people laugh? We did some work yeah. years ago on tickling. They did a study on tickling. Yeah. Because well, no, it, it, for exactly they the same should. reason. What, you know, yeah. what is tick, tickling is hugely powerful effect. You know, you roll around laughing. You know, I mean, it's, you, yeah. you, you come out and you lose control. You know, you, you, you cry, you know, with humour. Um, but it's almost unstudied. We were, we were interested to know if studied. it released. It should be, it should be studied. Do you do studies like this, David? No, well, I study drugs now. I used to, and that was just a sort of an experiment I did when I was just starting to do experiments. But now I've got a, I'm much more focused on, on, on pharmacology. What are you studying at this very moment, what, what's the thing at the front of your mind? Well, we've got two big projects. I mean, one is mm-hmm. uh, psychedelics for depression. We've just finished what will be the first head-to-head of, a, of magic mushrooms versus an SSRI. That okay, studies, what's the SSRI? Oh, a, a drug like Siroxat or Prozac, an antidepressant drug. Uh-huh. So uh, the, an SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. They're the gold Ooh. standard Antidepre- okay. When people take antidepressants these days, they're almost always given an SSRI. They chuck you one of those. Okay, and that was versus mushrooms. Yeah, well, psilocybin, yeah. yeah. How, Two did, doses, how did that yeah. go? We, it Who won? Got a bit, <laughs> we all know <laughs> shortly. We got a bit, we got a, it got a, we were very, we were lucky and unlucky. I mean, we, we managed to do most of it before COVID, but we had, we lost oh, some of, we lost some of the follow ups. So, we're in the oh, process at the end of doing the analysis and we've had to sort of re- rearrange it. I think I can say that it seems that psilocybin at least holds its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's only two doses, so we're giving two doses three weeks apart. Okay. Are they are they micro doses? No, no, they're real doses. No, they're real doses. Oh. No proper oh doses. Oh, my gosh. Psychedelic doses. Because we think this, you've got to have the psychedelic experience in order to kind of reset your brain so you can kind of break out of this malignant thinking depression is a very nasty disorder people get people's thoughts yeah. become very distorted and very hostile to them and yeah. you think you need the psychedelic experience to break them out of that mm. i mean it's possible that microdosing you know over a period of time would also loosen things up but that study's not yet been done and it's yeah. very difficult to do because of the illegality of the I mean, it's tough enough giving psilocybin twice over six weeks to people, but you imagine giving it every day. They have to come to hospital every day. So how do you get the approvals to do stuff like that? They're not, it's not legal the in difficulty. England, is it? No, but we get, it's, it is legal to use in research if you, get, if you pay enough money and, and, waste, and take enough time getting all the yeah. um, necessary you know, certificates from the Home Office. It takes, it takes about a year to right. jump through all the hoops to be allowed to start, and then it takes another six months to a year to actually manage then to get the medicine into the country and right. do the work on it. It's madness, isn't it? Very tedious, a total. Yeah, it's total. very irritating. Very irritating when, when you see the drugs that they do 
just easily give away. And some of them are so harmful. My God. I watched a documentary the other day on, oh, what's that drug they give to kids in America? Um, I was just talking about it. Were you thinking it. of Ritalin, Adderall. were you? Adderall. Uh, Adderall, yes. Adderall it was. And it's basically meth, isn't it? No, it's not. It's amphetamine. It's amphetamine, not methamphetamine. It's a range of, like speed. It's not good for kids, though, I don't think. Well, it depends. What do it you depends. think? Because <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, it sounded like a bad idea. You know, like if your yeah, kid's it's... running around and they're crazy, why don't you just, I don't know, take them to the park? But if you give them amphetamine, yeah. it's going to be a bit of a problem because isn't that addictive? Not in kids, no. Inter it's very not interesting, addictive? Actually, very in it's not, no, because it's a very important message here. Those people who use amphetamine know it doesn't, it, it doesn't get into the brain very fast. The things that the most addictive things get in the brain fast. So that's mm. like when you snort cocaine, it gets in the brain, mm -hmm. or you smoke heroin, or you inject heroin. They mm -hmm. get into the brain within, you know, 15, 20 seconds. And that gives you a really fast high, and that's very addictive. Right. When you take amphetamine orally, actually, most people don't get high at all because it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get in the brain. The reason we have, for instance, methamphetamine the reason people smoke methamphetamine is because it's like smoking heroin it gets in the brain faster whereas amphetamine mm -hmm. you can't smoke so so yeah that so people i mean people can have fun on speed but it's you, you don't it's not as addictive as cocaine or, or crystal interesting i know a lot of people that think they're addicted to cannabis like yes. really truly believe that they are physically addicted. Yeah. And I've read a lot of things that say you can't be physically addicted to it. You can be mentally addicted, but not physically. No, you can be physically addicted. You can be physically dependent on cannabis. That's right. And we, do you know how we know that? Yeah, tell me. So it's all about the receptor. Okay. CB1 or CB2? CB1. I don't think the studies have been done with CB2. It would be hard to do. But for CB1 receptor, and this study hasn't really been done in humans, but it's certainly been done in, in rodents. So if you, if you get a, a rat stone day after day after day after day on THC, mm -hmm. and then you give it an antagonist. We have an antagonist at the receptor. And an antagonist blocks the receptor. So THC stimulates the receptor. Mm -hmm. And the antagonist blocks the receptor. So then if, you, if you're permanently stoned and then you give someone the antagonist, or give the rat the antagonist, it goes into withdrawal, just in the same way. So the withdrawals from cannabis, I mean, we're talking extreme ones, you know, people that take it a lot, a lot, a lot. What are the worst side effects of the withdrawal? So I'll, let me just, I'll just finish. A, Bad dreams, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, point, the thing about cannabis is that withdrawal isn't that obvious, which is why we thought for a very long time that it, it wasn't, yeah. didn't cause dependence and you didn't get physically dependent on it. Now we know you you can, and that, but because when you stop smoking, you go into a withdrawal slowly over a number of days, yes, then you so you certainly do have problems mm. to see. You often lose your appetite, people get irritable, uh, you know, they're sometimes a bit sweaty, but it's not the profound syndrome that you see when you stop heroin, for instance. Mm. So I think that's why a lot of people thought co uh, cannabis didn't cause withdrawal, but in fact it, it does. And the biggest problem with, with cannabis withdrawal, to be honest, is the craving, is it people wanting to use it again. Yeah. And then, of course, that that cycle of, of use to deal with feeling miserable in withdrawal is one of the reasons people carry on using. We'll get back to the interview in just a second. I just want to thank all the Drug Science Community members for your continued support. Without you, the dissemination of information like this would not be possible. Drug science is, and always will be, independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. But by becoming a Drug Science Community member, You'll be helping us bring about change. You'll also receive access to exclusive events and will be able to attend all drug science events for free. To see how to become a community member, click on the link in the show notes. Now, where were we? Let's get back to the show. So does it, does it change the body physically? Um, you said that you can maybe sweat more or... Is there any studies on what it does really physically apart from, apart from just really wanting it? Yeah, it doesn't seem to. It's not. It's not like alcohol, for instance, where if you go into alcohol withdrawal, you get. Well, mm. yeah. I mean, you can die. I mean, you know, you have delirium tremens, yeah. and and you have, you get. You know, you can become completely paranoid. You can actually have seizures, etc. So, it, yeah. Again, cannabis is way less serious than that. And the same, you know, it's way less serious than heroin withdrawal, where 
you know you can get terrible pains and, and terrible blood pressure surges etc so it's it's a it's a more gentle withdrawal um we know well we think it's just a, it's what's called neuroadaptation if you if you stimulate a receptor enough the brain the body adapts and um we don't to be honest we don't fully understand exactly what's going on but it, it sort of fits with the principle <laughs> that if you if you take too much of something your body will yeah, we'll try to get upset if itself. you stop if you stop giving it to it. Yes, but it's not in everyone, and this is what's interesting. And you know, this, uh-huh. there's not, I don't think there's a single drug which you could guarantee every single person would get addicted to. Really, not even her- heroin? No. Well, it's, some people. I guess some people try it once and then never try it again. Correct. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It does yeah. happen. A friend of mine said to me the other day. He goes, "I was at a festival the other day, and I smoked heroin." And I was like, "What? <laughs> what were you doing?" He goes, "I didn't mean to do it. It was by accident. I had no idea that it was heroin." Yeah. And um, he said, "It was fantastic. I'll never do it ever again." <laughs> yeah. Well, there you <laughs> and that go. was it. Yeah. yeah it was, uh, uh, well, the two things to say. Thank God he smoked it and didn't inject it. Yes. <laughs> That's the first yeah, thing. Yeah, I think to then he probably would have known. <laughs> Uh, and the other thing is um, the people that get dependent on drugs are usually using drugs, not for fun, but no. to deal with some other problem in their life. They're self-medicating. Mm. How would you suggest you could help somebody that was a real addict, like and not in a good way, you know, not using it for medicine or anything like that? How would you suggest they go about getting help? What, for cannabis or, or anything? For, I suppose, any drug, that if, if they're using it because of other issues... You yeah. know, if they're using it because they hate their life, for instance. The really important thing is to make that insight. People shouldn't mm. use drugs. And that's that's the same as absolutely true of alcohol. If you're using drugs, you should always wonder why you're using drugs. Is it to have fun? Okay. Is the fun, does the fun outweigh the harms? Okay. If the fun doesn't outweigh the harms, then think very carefully. One of the key giveaways is if you're using the drug alone. Yeah. If you're using, you know, I mean, if you're using a social drug by yourself, then you're almost certainly using it to deal with some inner distress and then get help. I mean, there are loads of places you can go and get help. You know, the, the, the NHS has, has addiction services, but the private, you know, you mm. get someone, talk to someone about why you're doing it and see if you can work out other ways of dealing with those problems. Yeah. We are lucky in England because the NHS is there. They're ready and waiting, aren't they? They're just like open arms. Come on. Let well, they are, yes, um, and they're, actually they're, they're getting better, at, and particularly in drug-related problems. They're, they're forgetting yeah. alcohol a bit, but they are quite good on drugs, yeah. Yeah, that's important, I think, so people don't feel so worried about saying it as well, and that there's this massive stigma attached. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons I'm quite keen to communicate this idea of, of self-medication is because that that can help de there's still a feeling, especially in some of the press, you know, that anyone who uses drugs is just completely hedonistic and it just doesn't care and is just having a great time. But the mm. majority of people, even the people who use alcohol, they're using it to deal with stress, not to have fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if they are dealing with the stress, um, you know, in a good way, if they say, I don't know, have a glass of wine and a chat and that helps them with their stress, surely they'd be more healthy. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, if they're having two bottles of wine, maybe not. Yeah. But if it's just a little glass of wine to chill out at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm quite radical. I mean, I'm it, a lot of uh, people think I'm too relaxed about this, but I agree with you. I think I think alcohol is one of the great social... It is the great social drug. Yeah. And the, the problem is, how do you make sure people don't overdo it? So a glass of wine a day contributes very little to health harms, but gives you probably quite a lot of pleasure, particularly if yeah. you're doing it socially. But a bottle of wine a day starts to seriously eat into your life expectancy. Yeah, too much sugar as well. Bloody hell. They say... There's like one Mars bar per glass of wine. That's Oof. not true. <laughs> Is it not? <laughs> no, okay, no, help me no. feel better about this, Doc. Well, it depends how big your glass of wine is. And remember, you know, what size glasses do you? What size glass do you drink? I do a little one, maybe maybe a medium size. I don't like the big ones because they get warm. Not up for that. Oh, you're okay. So you're a white wine person. Okay. Yeah, I like. Okay, the so white you're wine. probably one seventy five, aren't you? A medium. About 100 calories in that. It's not a, not a Mars bar. It's not too bad, is it? <laughs> I agree. It's not too bad. It's... Oh, it's not too bad. You've got to have a little bit. You've got to have a little bit of fun. Everything in moderation. Um, as far as pain goes, what would you say is the best drug to deal with pain that isn't going to hurt your body in the long run? 
if there was one. I know most painkillers, I mean, I'm talking serious pain, most yeah, yeah, painkillers yeah. cause so many awful side effects yeah. that, that aren't worth it. Well, you'll be very interested to know that mm. my charity, Drug Science, we've just done a really deep, in-depth analysis of different treatments for what's called neuropathic, chronic neuropathic pain, which is that okay. pain that people have after they've, say, had a, an injury to a limb in a motorcycle accident or something, or yep. I've had tumours that have been cut out, and then the, the, the pain persists even though there's no reason for the pain because the pain becomes lodged in their brain. And uh, there are two dimensions to this question. The first is how effective is our drugs at reducing the pain? And then the second is how acceptable they are. So you can have, you know, you might be able to get rid of the pain completely, but on the other hand, you might not be able to stand up or be able to think. Right. And so we looked at this balance between the efficacy and the tolerability. And we did it, interestingly, with, with patients from the United Patients Alliance who actually were experts, people who they were treating themselves. They'd, they'd been through a whole gamut of different medications for their chronic neuropathic pain. And it turned out that the cannabis medicines did very well. They're ah. almost as good as anything else for controlling the pain, but they're very much better tolerated. So you don't get the side effects and you don't have the risks that other painkillers do. I mean, clearly opiates are very risky because they can kill you if yeah. you accidentally overdose. So the, particularly the combination of THC and cannabidiol, mm -hmm. that came out, that came out top. We're hoping to get that published very soon. That's brilliant. So the combinations of THC and CBD, I know they have to be heavier on one side and lighter on the other to deal with specific ailments. Um, I know, I say yes. I know, I don't know anything. I think, <laughs> um, I hear that for certain ailments, it needs to be higher in CBD and lower in THC. And yeah. for cancer, it needs to be higher in THC. Correct, yes. How could you, I suppose you couldn't really achieve that if you were growing it and making the oil at home. Because you'd have to be a scientist to do well, that. Well, that's how, quite how tricky, you... isn't it? Yeah, you could yeah. You could grow hemp, which has got a lot of cannabidiol in, and you could grow cannabis, which has got THC. You could mix them. But, I mean, I think the better way is to try to get into... Um... So we have that in the UK now? Well, we have the Drug Science 2021 programme, where we're trying to recruit 20,000 people into medical cannabis treatment over the next two years. Yay. And Ooh, pain is one of the job. main indications. So if people are listening to this mm. and are, have, are in pain and, and want to get into the trial, then um, then they should um, go onto the Drug Science website, drugscience.org.uk, and then you can register there. That's fantastic. Oh, thank God. Well done. Because um, it seems like it's taken a very long time to get to that point. Oh, it's been really sad. I mean, it's, we have been so far off the pace in this country. I've, it's, it, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for my country. And also, I mean, I'm embarrassed because it's doctors that are yeah. dragging their heels. And I find that, that really sad. The patients are going to doctors saying, I'm having to buy this stuff illegally. Yeah. And doctors are saying, well, there's no evidence it works. And the patients are saying, well, it does work because I've stopped all this other stuff you were on, the opiates, the pre -gabalin. And it does work. And the doctors say, no, it doesn't work because there's not been a trial. And that is such bad medicine, such lack of understanding of, of the, the needs of individual patients. It's so short-sighted. It's very frustrating, you know. When you go and you're speaking with a doctor, the doctor is the person that you trust, you know. So you yes. kind of want them to at least have a look into it. But they won't Precisely. look into it if it's not on the list of things that they're allowed to look into. So yes. how, how do they put it on that list? I guess that's our government, isn't it? Well, it is. No, the thing is, in a strange way, the government, when it made cannabis a medicine in 2018... It actually didn't specify any indications. It basically said said you doc, a specialist doctor, a consultant doctor can use cannabis for any med any illness, any disorder that they feel would benefit. Oh, nice. So in a fact, bit of you can use it, but no doctors there's only in the last year and a half, what, twelve prescriptions on the NHS? Because in the most of the half, patients, 12? most of the children only twelve, most of the children who are are getting control of their seizures, their serious seizures through cannabis medicines are still getting it privately and it's costing them thousands of pounds a month. And it's because doctors don't want... Oh, I don't know, I've written... I just actually had a paper on this just accepted, just to, you know, just this today mm -hmm. from BMJ. I think it's because patients have sorted the problem and doctors just don't want to be told what to do with their patients, which is, to mm -hmm. my mind, the most ridiculous thing. If I'm... 
If someone came into my clinic and said, I've worked out a cure for me, can you help me and, and learn from it? I'd say yes. Yes. But, but this, uh, I, I, I've, the ignorance and the resistance in the medical profession is frightening. It's odd, isn't it? I wonder where that all comes from. I mean, it could be arrogance. I don't know. Is it fear? Are they fearful that they'll be sued if, if it goes wrong? Or I mean, if, if they yes. would look into it, they would know that it wouldn't hurt the patient, so they wouldn't be so fearful. All they have to do is look into it. But they so won't. I've been, doing a, I've been doing a lot of lectures to people that are in, to doctors are interested. And what I've mm. discovered, medical students are really interested. Junior doctors are really interested. Senior doctors mm. aren't interested. Senior doctors say, we won't do anything until NICE tell us what to do. And mm -hmm. we know that the studies that NICE require for NICE to make a decision will never be done for one simple reason, that you can't patent herbal cannabis. You can't patent cannabis oil because it's... patent a plant. <laughs> or a plant product. Exactly. So, so those studies will never be done because they rely on patents. So if those studies oh. never get done, doctors will never be told by NICE or given from NICE the, the quality of evidence that they supposedly want. So doctors have got to make their own minds up. They've got to, they've got to do trial and error like you, you, know, you used to do in the old days when you were being a, a kind of wise doctor. But we have set up education. There's online education now for any doctor that's interested. We're also we're finding nurses are more sympathetic because, of course, nurses have to deal with the the people who who are in chronic pain, who aren't getting good help and and are suffering mm -hmm. side effects. So, so the drug science is working really hard to try to promote knowledge and education, but it's uh, it's a slow process. You know, it takes twenty years to go from being a medical student to being a consultant, and mm. you know, it's, we can't wait that long. <laughs> No, definitely not, especially when it, it could help people with cancer and, you know, it could basically slow the death rate in that area. It's like, it, wow, absolutely. let's not let people die, please. Well, that and also get people off opiates and, and get people in a better quality of life. And it's, yeah. uh, you've got it's me It's upsetting, a, isn't it? I know? find it very distressing because, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm, I make the analogy with penicillin. When penicillin was discovered in 1945, Doctors didn't say, oh, I'm not going to use this green sludge until someone tells me it works. Doctors say, oh, my God, at last, we've got something that works when other things don't. And let's just try it. But we've, we've kind of almost de-stopped doctors thinking now. They're almost like they're, they're automatons that are told what to do by NICE or by pharma companies. And mm. that's, uh, they've lost their sort of sense of adventure and also interest. Yeah, in finding out how to fix somebody, which is the job. I wondered, I was reading your, um, the essay that you wrote, you know, the history of cannabis and you were talking about, oh, Slinger, uh, so sh what the hell is his name? They Harry Anslinger, Harry Anslinger. That's Anslinger, Anslinger, yeah. So he, he is a big part of the reason why um, the prohibition on cannabis That's happened, right. So, right? So this is the man who was promoted to be the head of the Drug Enforcement Agency to fight the mafia over alcohol prohibition. And he became the second most famous man in America, uh, not after the president, by the way, but after J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI. And then, um, and then the, the Senate vote for alcohol to become legal. Yes. So then, what was he supposed to do? <laughs> well, he he could have said, "Great, I'll retire." No, no. But he decided no, no, he's no. <laughs> very important. He's got thirty-five thousand men. He wants to keep his little army. Right. I mean, America's the only country in the world that has a separate army to deal with drugs. I mean, no other country does that. Mm, there's so much money in it, though. Oh ridiculous amounts of money. There's so much money in arresting all these people. Absolutely, and put him in prison, all the private prisons. So he decided yeah. he was going to find another problem. It was cannabis. He decided it was cannabis. He changed the name to marijuana, and he's just started blaming Mexicans. And yeah, and the rest is history, because that's what the current president's still doing now. So that's when it started. The drama kind of started with him. But why do we, and I've noticed certainly recently, we follow the US a lot, I mean, in everything, which is quite interesting because yeah. we're, the UK is a very old country and actually we kind of started that country over there, well, started, took over for the poor people that were actually living there. Um, yes. You know, the history of England goes back and it can be quite terrifying, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. But we follow them in these madnesses. Why? Uh, well, <laughs> it's called money. Of course. <laughs> Silly me. Until 2016, every single decision that the British government made about drugs under the Misuse of Drugs Act was done at the behest of America. When I was working for the ACMD, God. they kept wanting us to ban CAT. 
And I said, why? And they said, because we've banned it and people are importing it from England. And I said, well, you know, then the simplest thing is just unban it. And they put pressure on us through the through the, through the Foreign Office and through actually the Prime Minister in the end to get mm-hmm. us to align with them. And as they do on almost every other country in the world, because the, the USA mm-hmm. basically funds the United Nations and the United Nations does right. on drugs what the They've Americans got a bigger stake us. in it, so they get to make... Call the shots. They get they call the shots, and if you don't play ball, they take away your money. Well, it's, it's scary, isn't it? So when they decide, and they will, because it does make so much money, when they decide to legalise cannabis, and, well, anything, really, we'll probably turn around and go, yeah, OK, we'll do it too. <laughs> I hope so. I think that's what's going to happen. Well, I, yeah, it would be... It would be so much nicer if we actually just show, show a bit of initiative and did it. But just a quick thing, I know we have to finish soon, but yeah. when Anslinger in America said cannabis had no medical value in 1934, mm. British doctors held out. We held out to 1971. We kept it as a medicine to 1971. So we did, and eventually they beat us down. So mm. we're, one of the, we're one of the very few countries that have ever stood up to them, just on medical cannabis. But now we've given in, you know, we've unfortunately, our politicians have started joining in They're at the mm. same mindset as the Americans, which is basically to be electable, you've got to be hard on drugs, which is exactly, you know, I mean, it's, it's bad politics. It's, it's just unhelpful, thinking. isn't it? If we were to legalise every drug mm-hmm. and I guess have some sort of, I don't know, control over it and sell it in a nice way and legally and everyone's fine, then surely, maybe this is simplifying it way too much, but... All of the gangsters that kind of have to kill, have to, have to is the wrong yeah, word, yeah, 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 that yeah. end up killing all these people over drug money, that would stop. You don't need to legalise to do that. You just need to decriminalise. You just need to do what Portugal did. No drama. You don't have to confront the United Nations and the WHO. You just say, we're going to decriminalise, like Portugal's done. And at mm-hmm. a stroke, you turn people from being criminals to being people who need help. And you'll mm. do what Portugal did, which was dramatically reduce the costs of policing drugs and also the number of people dying. In Portugal, in 15 years of decriminalisation, heroin deaths have fallen to one third of what they were. In Britain, we've carried on our policy of prohibition criminalising and our deaths have gone up. So we've gone exactly the wrong direction. And, and now we know there's a way forward which we should embrace. Do you think that's going to be embraced in the next few years? I've got a good feeling. <laughs> Well, <laughs> but I am an optimist because I'm trying to live a long yeah, time. <laughs> I was, yeah, good for you. You'd be. I said very interesting. One interesting thing is happening now is that we're launching our new drug science psychedelic clinical psychedelic working group, and that's to try to get psychedelics as medicines. And on that group, we have a Labour whip, and we have a Conservative spokesperson. So I'm beginning to get a traction with the, with the two major parties. One of the, if, if they would agree not to be partisan about this, if they would agree that this is something, just like the COVID, to put party political differences up to the one side and deal with the drugs problem and come together, it could be sorted out overnight. Oh, I'm going to cross my fingers on that. I think it can be, and I think it will be. I see a change coming. Well, I hope you're right. It's going to be good. Well, when it does, <laughs> we'll talk again, all right? Oh, yeah, definitely. We can have a little powwow when that does, over a glass of wine. (laughs) Well, maybe with my new synthetic alcohol by that time, all right? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that. We'll talk about that. When when I have some, I'll share it with you. Cool, perfect. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thanks for letting me come on. Great to talk to you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Well, I've certainly exposed more of myself than I normally do doing a podcast. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and... uh, the good news is it just has got her own podcast. It's called A Cup of Happy, and it started yesterday. So uh, now if you enjoyed what she did to me, you can enjoy her doing that to other people, such as Darren Brown. And of course, if you've enjoyed the Drug Science Podcast with me, then do share with your friends. Do sign up to become a community member, because then you'll get the benefits of uh, many of the activities of drug science, including some publications, new publications next year. And of course, being a community member means that you give us the vital underpinning that allow us to continue the excellent work we do in terms of telling the truth about drugs and having wonderful podcasts. Thank you for listening. <laughs>